All right. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to say welcome to DrupalCon. I'm excited to be here. How about everybody? Is everybody excited? I mean, it's nice to be back in person um, after a few years, and so I'm super excited. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, we're going to be sharing about a project that's been over two years in the making. Um, and so get ready to walk through some approaches uh, from inception through the launch of the first site using this new platform at Penn State. So a little bit on the uh, agenda for today. Um, these approaches are all rooted in strategy. So we're going to be talking a lot of strategy today. We're going to start with product strategy, and which was kind of that guiding light through the entire project. And then we're going to dig into the technical strategy for the project, uh, which will guide us through implementation. And then we'll wrap up with some insights, which I think is really interesting today, because that's going to help us talk through some uh, those similar current and future project uh, things that will help us in, in those uh, upcoming projects that you may have. All right, we'll jump in a little bit about us, and I'll kick off since I'm already talking here. Um, my name is Mark Shropshire. Um, I go by Shrop. I've got 20 plus years of experience uh, at the intersection of leadership and technology. Uh, some of my past roles have been with universities um, and a nationally recognized graphic communication company, some tech startups prior to coming to Media Current, which is where I'm currently at. Um, I love helping individuals reach potential, I'm big into leadership and mentorship, uh, and, and frankly, empowering leaders and empowering everyone to become leaders um, uh, who wants to. And so I will turn it over to Jim now. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Jim Norse. I am a developer and a program manager with 20 plus years experience in large decentralized research universities, such as Penn State, but also University of California, Harvard, Dartmouth, Boston University. My passion is helping moving big things from A to B, sometimes as a developer, sometimes as a leader in places where change can often um, happen slowly. And my key role in this project was to, I like to think, is earn buy-in and internal investment from the C-suite leaders who sponsor and, and fund change. But supporting nonprofit education, research, and healthcare enterprises is a form of public service to me that I am very passionate about. So Penn State is big. Penn State is really big. And not only by counting the number of students and alumni, um, our research enterprise is enormous on the scale with John Hopkins, MIT, M Michigan, if you measure by National Science Foundation funding metrics and the like. Uh, we're one of only two universities with all four land grants. That's land, sun, excuse me, four grants, land, sun, space, and sea. And the website we're here to talk about today, our news website, is a uh, single large website that tells and has told for 20 years research stories that highlight the impact of our science and our research and, and the impact it has on the Commonwealth and the people of Pennsylvania, on the nation, and on the world as long as telling a number of other public relations stories. So, but my perspective comes from this, the central office of strategic communications and marketing at Penn State. So we functionally own new storytelling. It's our website. But we're also stewards of the brand itself. So it's notable here that Penn State has over, you know, best estimate over a thousand subdomains distinct to date that are bound only by the loosest digital uh, brand standards, web strategy, stacks, and operations. And just hold on to that thought. <laughs> um, so I just want to mention a little bit about Media Current, um, uh, since that's where I'm at. And um, we were a partner with Penn State and, and Jim's teams throughout the project. Um, Media Current, we bring together talented team members, and we like to build those world-class solutions, such as this Penn State news site. Uh, we're really happy and proud to support and focus on open source solutions, uh, being an open source product company, uh, including but not limited to, you know, projects that are out there like Drupal, like Gatsby, React, things like that. Um, and we're deeply passionate about partnering, partnering with clients and their teams. Okay. So this was a complicated 
website build. It was a visible project involving a lot of new technologies, multiple partners, and a lot of moving parts. And ultimately, it was successful. Uh, but it was one of the most challenging projects I've ever been a part of. And I'll be very honest with you, there were a number of times we paused and asked ourselves, why are we doing this again? <laughs> why would a central communications office select a decoupled architecture for one of the biggest multi-channel, highly integrated, on-brand websites with hundreds of authors and very low fault tolerance? Well, if you stay with me, I think that question can start to answer itself. We found that something this big and complex demanded that we break it down to each component segment focus on each thing as a service in isolation just to get our minds wrapped around it. And thinking like that unlocked many possibilities for us to scale the work for bigger purposes. Purposes and services in service of the brand and ultimately the institution. Uh, but there were a few tough months where I and the team were asked difficult questions from our internal stakeholders, which led to some uncomfortable discussions with our partners, but we all knew that we had the right strategy, right? We had asked the right questions. We chose the right partners, the right services, vendors, technologies. Um, many difficult but necessary conversations with our leadership about the total cost of investment and how to truly calculate long-term savings and measure um, and, and measure ultimate return. You know, these conversations were successful because we had the right long-term product strategy. But first, we need to tell you a little bit about the business situation we faced three years ago. Uh, so our legacy website. So it's a, it was it, it is it was a big website. Lots of users, loads of integrations up and downstream. It was very custom. It was, it was hosted on premises. It's a, it was a Drupal 7 monolithic architecture supported in part by vendors and in part by uh, in-house system administration labor with some fairly old school uh, web ops methods. And it was becoming hard to maintain. It was, D D7 was end of life, or so we thought. <laughs> <laughs> The communications business situation uh, is and was like, functionally we're a decentral like, like, we're functionally we're a decentralized public relations and communication business. We're a large institution. We have many campuses. We have many departments. We have many units, and they all have their own distinct website or sites, with their own workflows, sometimes their own goals. Um, Authors put all authors, all most authors around the university do have a connection with the news site. They're putting their content in our website and they've been in the habit for a decade of fetching their content back out either by API or RSS or some combination of both. And the content that's published in our system is available in multi, multiple channels. So we publish the stories in our website, but it, it's also anything that gets approved by our editorial workflow is, it's queued up for uh, email blast syndication, and our, this platform integrates with an old LESSERV that you know, we calculate. It's low estimate, something like 30 million individual email blasts. It's a major part of our marketing strategy. So big site, 250 authors representing 20 plus campuses, locations, 50 plus you know, major departments, units, and colleges. Okay, it's big. Our big idea was three years ago, it, what if we broke up what we already had into atomic segments and then glue it back together and manage it chunk, chunk by chunk, each as its own thing? So convert the legacy website into a platform with reusable segments. Build on what we already had because what we already had was a content hub. We already had a business process where users across the Commonwealth are submitting stories to use on multiple channels and getting their content back out. We already had APIs. We had a design that was reflected our best current thinking on the, of the brand. Nearly every segment in this one large website could be thought of as a reusable component, so we thought. So some principles started to get clear. Uh, start to think beyond websites. Strive to avoid the constant cycle of rebuilds. Uh, leverage the brand, right? From the position we sat where we were, we're stewards and owners of the brand, leverage the brand and our position in the university as stewards of the brands as a call to action. 
So I call this my the fever dream slide because, you know, and everything's going great. This is where we're going, right? So enhancing and protecting the brand is an objective that helped us think beyond a single website and towards a set of tools and standards that we could anchor a broad web strategy to. So we tried to elevate this work and to have impact on the organization's strategic plan and on the bottom line itself. So as many of you or all of you know, academia and .edu is the ultimate horizontal business. It's the opposite of top down uh, where mandates do not work. And if you're serious about change, you have to make friends and partnerships um, and facilitate change with carrots. So our creative and our development par partners, and I'm talking in-house and our vendors, the people who execute the brand, they need things like digital strategies and standards and APIs and content strategies, patterns, rules, style guides. They also need access to authorized cloud providers, Penn State authorized and modern web op solutions. So we're not encouraging mere copying of things, rather than we're, we're building starter kits. And we believe that taking a thoughtful point of view, particularly on the design system segment of all this and, and all of its related strategies enables a centralized digital center of excellence, one that can perform things like digital strategy consulting, SEO optimization across the domain, web product and project management consultative services, trying to catch like all major web, all major web refactors sort of early in the process so we can have some influence on their outcomes. Uh, central UX strategies leading to, you know, digital transformation. And finally, this is my highest concept thing. So Agile's more than a framework to us. To, uh, it's a philosophy. It's a philosophy about how to embrace uncertainty when building products and adopting technologies. Like anti-fragile things are things that benefit from a little controlled chaos. And I think this is a useful mindset um, for a technical strategist at least. And open source itself, it's anti-fragile in the nature of its construction and the way the community supports it. Uh, and you know, I'll, I'll, I'll name Chuck Gatsby here is a sort of partner that has learned from the stressors that we have put on their system. And they have hardened, hardened their infrastructure as a, as a result, not just for us, but for the whole community, for the whole framework. So, okay, that vision's real nice, but we still needed to build this big performant news website. We needed to migrate seven gigs of data need to re-slug every story. We needed to host it in the cloud and automate our DevOps shop. We need that now, please. Um, you know, just noting some of the requirements, you know, custom authoring workflow, preview, security, search, both Google and an internal search, uh, content API, RSS, single sign-on, data migration, slug pattern, recasting. We need to glue it to a single domain strategy, lots of integrations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And plus we need a preview to work the way authors expected it, we needed to be able to publish our stories within five minute increments. Um, excuse me. And while you're at it, please build us a scalable platform. So uh, here, workflow segregation means to us empower Penn State to own the segments that are closest to our, our business. So our design system and our front ends, these are good examples of that. Costs. I choose to think this is in turn, uh, think about this as more about cost predictability is the is the primary driver here. So accurate cost forecasting is critical, right? When you're doing big things, especially when it changes how your organization operates. So there's major changes happening in the IT business here at Penn State concurrent to this effort. There's an emphasis on more cloud services and away from IT of, tr of, uh, of treating IT as overhead, for example. So our previous setup administratively really was one where the costs of PSU.edu and the new site, they were largely absorbed in IT overhead. We had no real good way to cost this. So our vendor costs hit the chart of accounts, but it left system administration, security, network infrastructure, DevOps, emergency response, hardware config, patching, upgraded, monitoring, logging, all that was unpriced and unbilled. It was just unseen overhead. And this led to our stakeholders to, in the past, to believe that once a website is done, we can stop paying for it, right? Well, no. Uh, being able to price each segment and forecast and plan its maintenance allowed us to change how leaders think about 
the total cost of investment in these technologies and our websites that are critical to us. This is my last slide. So when we decoupled everything, we landed in a place where we can now be selective about how to best maintain each segment of the platform as a commodity with its own life cycle, its own support cadences. We can make choices. Is one segment, can it be cloud source? Can it be outsourced? Can it be in source? Can we do team augmentation? Manage each segment opportuni uh, opportunistically as the need rises. We're thinking that how we optimize and manage and scale of the design system segment, which is the next frontier of this platform, the design system and its ancillary code and instructions are how most of our adopters are going to experience the segments of the platform that are relevant to them. But design systems, you're going to hear a lot about design systems, I feel, this week, <laughs> are not enough to accomplish brand unity and great web strategy. So we think of it as a library of plays and a playbook, strategies that come with codes and guides and other things. So one example of what I'm talking about, like a single component organism that blends design tokens, grid patterns, multiple APIs, all working together is it's simple for a major uni university federated navigation, brand bar. Seems simple, right? What if you wanted to reuse that across an organization? There's various methods. So ours contains an alert ABI, API from Firebase via Drupal. It has NIV items from S3. It's via, right now it's via Expression Engine and uh, soon to be contentful maybe. Uh, we have Google Search APIs, Apache Solar. It's all wrapped together in a single component that can function more or less out of the box on an adopter's websites. So I've said enough. I'm going to let Shrop tell you how we actually achieved some of these things. Well, first of all, Jim, thanks uh, for being such a great partner throughout the project uh, and for putting in all the hard work. And, and of course, the teams. We're speaking for teams, a lot of teams involved, lots of people involved in making this happen across um, you know, Gatsby, Acquia, Penn State, Media Current. And uh, so, um, but let's shift into technical strategy. Uh, so um, I, I promise for everybody in here that's, uh, that may not be super technical, we're not gonna get really in the weeds. We're trying to keep this at a higher level, but I will still hopefully uh, satisfy some of those that are technical with uh, some technical talk in, involved. And we're happy to talk about this after the talk this week uh, at DrupalCon, but we'll kind of shift into things and, and, and really more about the decisions of technology and why we made some of these decisions uh, for implementation, which I think are foundational um, in, in this platform. So we are talking about the Penn State News site, but we're also talking about building platforms. And so, so speaking of building foundations, you know, uh, one important message today, if you took away anything, besides everything Jim said, because that's all important, but um, but I would say stop building those websites and start building platforms. And this is the this is the thing, Jim, you talked about over and over. I mean, we you know he cast the vision for us, and so the, all the teams involved kept seeing it this way, that we're building kind of a future, something that could be used over and over at Penn State, uh, this this Drupal and Gatsby and Firebase and all this all these technical things we're talking about, like can be packaged and reused as a platform uh, for the future. So, so you, when you take on a task building a platform, you still have to think about every decision along the way, which is pretty overwhelming. There's a lot there. Um, but you've got to step out of thinking of singularity of purpose. You've got to start thinking about the larger vision and provide flexibility and maintainability uh, for, for everyone and every piece along the way in the platform. Um, so let's dig kind of a little bit deeper into some of this. Um, so I'm going to start here with uh, design systems. You know, Jim mentioned it already, but um, I feel like this is, the, this is the important piece to start with. You've got to start with a great design system. It's an initial step. Uh, it's setting the vision for the platform. So we needed something that was highly flexible, component-based. Um, I'm going to say some other buzzwords here about <laughs> customizable options. And yeah, we've all heard these things, right? But ultimately, what am I really saying? I'm saying that design systems are ultimately critical. And then once you understand that and you start building uh, towards that, you can then figure out the technology that you need to implement. And so uh, we decided to leverage uh, Storybook, uh, which is a React um, uh, uh, open source product. And so it's, it's, it's a well-established component-based system. Um, and that allowed us to create a what we call a living style guide. Um, but ultimately what that means to me and the team and everybody involved is that there is a 
there is that uh, that playbook. Uh, you mentioned playbook. There's this playbook that you can refer to and say, this is how things are supposed to look, but not just how they look. This is how they're supposed to work, and that that's critical. So it's not just static. Um, so you know, by building these uh, the components that are flexible, editors can arrange the components in different orders. And so if you're thinking in a Drupal context, you may already fast forward mentally to where I'm headed with that, but to be able to change the order of how things look and feel uh, on a page or in a, in a news story. Um, and yes, that fast forward, if you thought about it, you're right. Um, uh, in this situation, we've used uh, Drupal paragraphs to make that happen. But we've also implemented a great deal of authoring experience work along the way. And I'll talk more about that, but there's just a ton of work on authoring experience because if you can't satisfy, you know, the 250 content editors that are going to be using a platform, how are you going to satisfy all of the millions of people who are going to consume the content? So design systems tell that story, they set the stage, um, and everything else is in the platform from there. So um, this is a fun slide. Being involved in Drupal for so many years, this is always a fun slide for me because I've seen Drupal change over the years. I've seen it uh, grow and kind of change with the times. Um, uh, as, as the web matures, new things happen, Drupal has kept up in many ways and adopted new technologies. Um, but Penn State has a history of open source. I think it's great. That made us a great partner. We're an open source product company at Media Current. But, um, but we wanted to build on what Penn State already had, and that was something that was set up from the very beginning of the project. Um, Penn State's got a long history with open source, Drupal, many other things um, involved, but, um, but here's some of the benefits, how we see Drupal fitting this project and, and really a lot of other projects, but particularly this project. So Drupal being a, what, what I like to say, and others have said, a content management framework, and what I mean by that, it's not just a system, it's a framework. It, you, it's, it doesn't have to be opinionated. You, it's very flexible. You can build a lot of things from it um, and from the ground up. Of course, it does have some opinions, but you know every system does to some extent. But we see it as a framework. It allowed us to build and customize that authoring experience. And this, this happened through fields and taxonomy, content moderation, user management, and more. And by the way, as a, uh, as a big Drupal fan, I, I know others in the room are as well. You're, we're at DrupalCon, so there should be. Um, I, I have to say, I love the fact that so many features are just in core, and I can flip a switch, turn it on, at least have a baseline to start from, right? Um, so, um, but Drupal also empowers content editors to control the layout of content. Um, so this is true for traditional Drupal sites, but it's also true for decoupled sites that we're talking about here. So editors can trust what they edit and then preview is what's going to go live into publishing. And this sort of fast forwards a little bit more into uh, uh, our implementation with, with Gatsby. Um, and making that happen because we need a Gatsby to actually do some of that, but I don't want to get too far ahead. It's exciting. Just hang with me. Um, Drupal also has an API-first architecture. This has been talked about for a long time. Dries has gone over this in many keynotes, but uh, lots of people have worked on this uh, that, that I'm highly grateful to uh, in the community, but this allowed us to make this Drupal site be the single source of truth, uh, and, and you know, Drupal's power is in its content, um, being a content hub. So. It allowed us to have successful governance, uh, uh, you know, policies related to that along the way, um, and then many consumers. You know, these are uh, applications, or you know, uh, could be mobile apps, could be websites, could be RSS feeds, whatever. But you know, there's all these these points of uh, uh, con uh, consumption from the Drupal site. But we're excited to be here at DrupalCon talking about. Uh, innovation, building new and modern web on top of Drupal. Again, I'm just always excited to see Drupal move forward. Um, and and it's, the, it's providing the back end for a strong decoupled system. Um, so we see the platform here as a potential model for other EDUs as well uh, that want to build on top of this. So if, if anyone's in the room um, has been involved in higher ed, works at higher ed, has worked in higher ed, I have in the past, and I can say that you know one thing I really like about higher ed is that open source uh, feel and vibe is like alive in the academic uh, world. So, um, and that's where a lot of that came out of. So it's really fun to be involved in a project like this and help out, um, help out other universities. So kind of um, speaking of scale and all the things that had to be done on this project, um, we did spend you know, that time on the content authoring experience. I'll get a little more detailed here. 
So we've got 250 content editors. Uh, Drupal's providing a very important service, and it needs to be easy to use for those folks. So uh, Drupal's ability to um, you know, create those custom authoring experiences and necessary workflows has been highly utilized here. And here's some examples. So some of those baked-in features, users, roles, permissions, content moderation uh, was key, taxonomy. And, and I feel like for, since Drupal 4.5, when I got involved with Drupal, which is dating me maybe, but like taxonomy has just always been there and it's something everybody talks about. And I remember the first time someone said taxonomy, I'm like, sort of, I get it from a library standpoint, but wh what is that really gonna do for me? But over the years, I've seen taxonomy drive so many things. It's, it's pretty, pretty uh, mind-boggling. But, um, but beyond those built-in core uh, features, we leveraged uh, contributing custom code to, as you, as you do, uh, to cover additional things like schedule publishing. We limited, this sounds so simple, we limited field character limits, and, and we had a UI, we had, there's a module to actually provide a count of those, uh, you know, how many uh, letters you've typed in the field. And, and I don't want to belittle something that seems so simple, but it's so important to a content editor. When they, be, they can see that there's a limit and they see the count, that's just helpful, it saves time. Uh, we were able to um, spend time focusing on clear field labels and descriptions. That is not the most exciting thing for a developer to work on. I'll just say it, but I will say though that like we have strategy partners, uh, media current folks like that, that are willing to jump in and help with that and it is, it is important. I mean, it has to be clear. What does that description field say? What, how does the user even know, uh, the content editor, what to put in a field? Um, so really, really important. So, um, so Penn State's partner with Acquia to also ensure that Drupal runs well um, for all the editors and the API endpoints. So there's a lot happening on this Drupal site. It's pretty big, beefy infrastructure going on uh, with Acquia that's providing lots of API endpoints. And at the same time, all of those content editors editing, and it, it, yes, I, I can talk more <laughs> later on this week, but there is a lot going on to keep everything coming along uh, well with that system. And we'll talk more about the API capabilities here in just a moment. So, um, so here a little bit, little bit more on Drupal's uh, the permissions roles, content moderation, making it easier. Um, really, just the key benefit here, and it's really critical for the new site specifically. It might not be as important for some of the future sites on the platform. It might be. It just depends. But on a on a think about a large scale newsroom. I mean, you saw all the stats. I mean, this is turning out lots of stories and images and videos all the time, every day. So. Um, so there's a lot of nuances in the mix uh, here, and you would be right. Content editors, for instance, can draft, and this is a real simplified kind of a description, but it makes sense, and it probably sounds familiar to some of you in your projects, but content editors can draft and work on content, but they can't publish. Um, but beyond that, like that's a real simplified version, like a small group of people can actually publish the content. But one thing that we spent time doing was actually hiding fields and from the, uh, the node edit view, making sure that certain fields just aren't visible. Like, so it's not enough the person doesn't have, you know, content editor doesn't have access to actually work on a field. How about just don't even make it show up? How about making the interface simpler for the content editor? Those are things that we worked on. Okay, so I'm gonna jump a little bit to something a little different here. Uh, and that's uh, separation of concerns. And this is, uh, this is something that plays off of uh, the, the, what Jim mentioned earlier about segments of the system overall. And, and don't worry, we're about to get into some interesting uh, uh, Gatsby parts of the project too, because that's the other half of what's going on here. Um, so we've talked about Drupal and all the features, and you're wondering probably like, what about Gatsby? Well, let's talk about it. So um, having Drupal and Gatsby um, operating independently um, allows content editors to work on their content while publishing only when ready. That sounds simple, and you might go, well, that sounds expected. And I'm like, well, you can do a lot of things to kind of make that not happen in a system. Um, so on a technical side, we benefit also from separating our development workflows. So not only do we have that like high-level content editor and publishing separation, but even our developers can operate independently working in the Gatsby React uh, code base and separately in the Drupal code base. And you have your teams that are best at each of those things working where they need to uh, simultaneous. And they can come together when they need to, but a lot of times we find that operating in the Gatsby segment is all that's needed for a certain feature. Um, so overall the platform um, benefits from allowing teams to optimize and improve working in these segments 
and not having these monolithic entities that they're having to work with. So we, we were talking about this earlier, Jim, but it's like, it, it's like we're kind of talking microservices, but not like we're firing up a bunch of uh, AWS Lambda instances. Not those kind of microservices, but it's like breaking up a system into smaller components kind of microservices. Whew, okay, that's a lot of stuff. I'm gonna take a breather. I'm just kidding. Let's jump right in. Speaking of Gatsby stuff, so this is important. Like, uh, and, and you know, maybe you haven't used Gatsby before. Maybe you haven't used, uh, maybe you've heard all the talks about decoupled and you haven't used decoupled, but, um, but I'm, I'm gonna give a little bit of background here that I think is really important about why Gatsby is important to the project and how it works uh, from, from my standpoint. And um, so, so there are three components here that, um, that, the way I see it, that provide development publishing workflows that, that we need for the Penn State platform. There's the Gatsby framework, and that's the React-based framework uh, that allows you to build those fast, secure, stable, accessible sites in Gatsby, which is, um, uh, you know, totally makes sense. Like, you gotta have the developer tools, you gotta have the things that spin up and work for developers and that allow them to, uh, to build the sites and build the, the Gatsby uh, components in. And then a the really critical part, Gatsby Cloud. So this helped us deliver that unified platform of building, previewing, and deploying Gatsby and, and this last part is so critical. It became critical. I don't even think we realized how critical it was. But these are not just buzzwords. Uh, being able to publish those to a global edge network, this is not just words. I'm telling you, it is critical. We tried deploying, and when you performance test against not an edge network, and, and on a scale like this, the, the site, if you've ever seen it, the sites will not hold up. So, um, so really important. And, uh, and we got to kind of be a part of a lot of, um, a lot of the, the growth of Gatsby Cloud and the release of the Gatsby uh, hosting um, uh, product. So there's also the Gatsby Content Mesh. I don't wanna skip over that. Um, that is really the decoupled data layer that, um, that it's, it's GraphQL um, from a technical standpoint, it provides the tools for the sourcing, normalization, updating of content. And this is, you can think of this is kind of what sits in between Drupal and Gatsby. It also sits in between Gatsby and any other source you're pulling from. Um, you can pull from Markdown files, you could pull from some other API, you can do all kinds of things with Gatsby, but having a common GraphQL um, uh, source to actually you know, query from is, is really a benefit there uh, because you're not having to like switch technologies and go, oh, well, how do I query that technology now? Like, how do I, you know, how do I hit this API? kind of don't have to worry about that in the same way. Um, so these are just a few of the benefits while the integration worked out really well for um, Penn State and, uh, and for the project. Um, but there's uh, one more which steps us back into Drupal content editing experience a little bit. So this is a little combo of, a uh, little bit of combo of Drupal and Gatsby, which I think is great. So, um, so a big benefit of uh, Gatsby for the content editors involved here is the Gatsby preview. And that lives inside of Drupal. And what's really cool about this is, um, I think, it's, it's a pixel-perfect preview. And, and I'm gonna say that again. It's a pixel-perfect preview inside Drupal of the content exactly the way it's gonna be published and look when it's published on the final site. Um, that almost doesn't sound like it makes sense as much until you really think about what it means to a content editor. To be able to really see what it's gonna look like immediately is, is a huge thing. It's a big deal. There's no loss of fidelity at all. Editors can see what they're gonna uh, go live with. And also keep in mind, some of these editors aren't the ones hitting the go live button, right? They wanna be able to hand it off to somebody that can hit the go live button and make sure it's the right thing from their standpoint. So. So that same design system that we've been talking about today, um, earlier on, remember that first thing that's critical, starting this a big platform and making all these decisions? That, that same design system, it powers the Gatsby front end. It also powers the preview system within Drupal. So we're using it everywhere. And, and you know, Jim was telling me some stuff er earlier today, like all kinds of plans he's thinking about in the future, but like it's, it's, it's making me get goosebumps going, oh my gosh, it's crazy. Um, I can be transparent with everybody, right? So it's exciting. Um, all right, so let's, um, let's talk a little bit here about the content API, content hub concept with Drupal. So um, I, had, I had the words here, epiphany. I think that was Jim's words. It was like an epiphany the team had, Jim had, but you know, um, he mentioned this earlier, Penn State was already operating as a content hub, but there really wasn't a formal strategy for it, right? Like you have a Drupal and it's got a lot of APIs connected to it. What, what does that really get you? Well. 
it's great, it's functionally working, but if there's really not a strategy, you don't even know how to maybe contact and work with consumers of your uh, APIs and things like that. So, um, so really this project helped realize Penn State to have a reusable content hub as a service. So thinking about the, everything as a service. So it's almost like within Penn State, what is being done within Penn State and isn't being um, outsourced to like cloud services uh, like Aqua and Gatsby and, and, and uh, companies like that. Um, it's almost like operating another service within, within the university, which is huge. Um, and Jim can speak more to that himself because that, that's, what, that's what he oversees. But, um, but a universal um, API standard is a foundation to the platform going forward is a big key here. Um, and so JSON API is mostly what we use um, for, for this, but we're not relying on just the single core Drupal JSON API endpoint. We're using it elsewhere. Um, and we're also delivering, um, uh, you know, from a content, content agnostic um, scenario here to the platform. Like we don't really, we, we really don't want to be opinionated about what the, you know, what the consumers, who the consumers are, what they are. We just want to be able to provide a service that we hope about anybody can attach to their services to, their sites, their apps, and all those things, and, and it'll work. So Drupal, a, Drupal's API-first architecture allows this uh, platform to provide content through a variety of methods. So I mentioned core JSON API. That's driving Gatsby publish and preview builds. Um, we're driving uh, campus alerts, which is, is really something close to my heart because that is so critical on a campus. And if you've been involved in higher ed, you realize you know th things can happen. You need to get notices out to people quickly, and there's a lot of time spent at universities building alert systems. And this is the start of something big for Penn State, uh, we believe. So uh, we're pushing that from Drupal, so a Drupal-only uh, authorized content editor can publish an alert, and that's really restricted. And that uh, Drupal pushes that to Firebase, and then Gatsby picks that up from Firebase after the page loads. Um, so it's not involved in the in the Gatsby build at all, which is a huge benefit. Um, and, and in Campus Sync, uh, which is a J, another JSON API endpoint, which allows you know all of these other partner sites, all these other Penn State campuses to actually pull data and and uh, pull that content and use it as they need on their sites across the system. So it's that reuse of data. So if that sounds interesting, think about it. We're reusing content. We're reusing content. We're reusing content over and over again, and we're not retyping content. We're not, here. here's a copy of this. Go put, here's a Word file. Go put it on your site. It's being reused. It's huge. So, so I think this project to me was, um, and I tried to look it up. Um, I don't remember which DrupalCon, and it blurs in my mind, but Dries uh, at a keynote talked about the vision of that API first infrastructure, uh, uh, you know, Drupal being API first and being a content hub. He spoke about that a number of years ago, and that stuck with me. And I think this, to me, was like the dream realized a bit. So, um, anyway, that's um, that's content hub, and uh, I'm gonna jump into a little bit here about how we maintain the platform. Like maintaining this platform is like never done, right? That's true. Uh, Jim mentioned that for any of our sites uh, that we work on and projects. But you know, we may see a cycle of, uh, you know, go through a cycle of seeking out, like those are the gaps in our code and defects and, and what opportunities can we improve on our platform. So um, the key here is really about taking those segments that we've talked about throughout this talk and then say, you know what, we can maintain and optimize and work on each segment independently. Um, we don't have to break away and, and say, um, you know, hey, we've got to take down the entire site to do a release. No, we don't. We can release each segment independently. This is really exciting recently. So we had some search improvements to make, and we're using uh, we're using Acquia Search, uh, which is uh, you know it's Acquia's version of Solar Search. They've got some other stuff wrapped up with it, and and then we have an API from Drupal, and then Gatsby. When you, and on the Gatsby front end, you do a search. It actually talks back to that Drupal API and and, and uh, returns results. But um, that's the overview of the system. But we had to really focus on each of these separately. So it, it, was, really, it was really neat because all of the changes that we needed to make were in Drupal. Like we were able to focus on fixing some Drupal API pieces and, and it took care of all the things. And we did a Drupal deploy um, to, you know, to put those out there when we were ready. And it didn't, it, you know, Gatsby said they're operating, has no idea anything's going on as far as that deploy. It just continues to operate as normal. Um, so to an end user, nothing had to be taken down. All systems were still running. This is important uh, for this platform. And um, 
but I, to help visualize a little bit of this, this is this is the slide. So <laughs> I'm going to pull it up. This is a little this is a little frightening, right? Because it's a lot going on. I know there's a lot going on, and and feel free to take pictures and all that stuff. But I will post the slides afterwards. Um, this is the technical overview. It's not as crazy as it seems once you get to know the platform. But I did want to hit on a couple of quick things, um, and that is that um, that notice. Notice some things we've talked about already, right? Drupal and Gatsby have their own Git repos, which help the separation of concerns and not always on optimization. Us to be able to manage those, the flows, those development workflows separately. Um, you know, we've got Aqua providing hosting for Drupal. Gatsby's providing um, uh, Gatsby Cloud hosting for the Gatsby front end. But we've also got some Amazon S3 involved, which is providing our image optimization and file services. Um, and, and there's some other pieces that Amazon's doing as well, but um, but I, want, I did feel like it was important, and Jim and I talked about this to show show this and and to you know be transparent about we're talking about these segments. What do they look like? That's going to be the next question. How do they work? So we're going to jump in now to a little bit about insights. Thanks, Rob. Um, I'll, I'll blow through this somewhat quickly. So uh, one key insight from me is I think everyone in this room, right, has done or you, you will do one really, really hard thing in your career. Um, and we've all worked on a project where there was, you know, one key person who had to make or break an effort, like a real MVP. This project had about 10 of those. Uh, Shrop being one of them, and they came from all three, you know, segments of the partnership. So I was really, really proud to be involved with uh, this sort of matrix of, uh, of people. And so a key insight for me is, like I said at the beginning, know your business, right, and uh, have a strategy and believe in your strategy. Uh, maybe point to a product owner if the project's big enough, write really good RFPs, and uh, try to choose some partners who have seen some stuff. Uh, as Shelby Foote said, it had four o'clock in the morning courage, if that means anything to you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so uh, one of the things, uh, as far as challenges um, to, to hit on here is new tech always pushes the limits. This is something, you know, Jim, you talked about a lot. And, um, you know, being, being on the bleeding edge definitely means that a lot of times there's there's few peers to talk about the challenges with you know there there was times where like jim and i were on a zoom going we don't know what to do and you know we reach out to kyle and kyle and gatsby helps us out with something and we're like but like that like it, it's a small circle of people that have worked on something this large and, it, and it's exciting at the same time it's very scary i mean i'll just be honest with you but um but so you know it, one of the Pieces that I think that helped, though, along the way was it led to us working through proof of concepts. I think proof of concepts is important in our work in like these large projects. We have to have ways to prove that an idea might work and limit that. So, you know, we had some examples. Like, we did proof of concepts along the way um, to solve the front end hosting of Gatsby. And, and we went through different scenarios of using AWS and Netlify, and, and, and we landed on Gatsby called host, hosting. And, and I have to say, and it, it's not just because it's newer, but I, I really, firm, I believe that that um, Gatsby Cloud Hosting is working so well because it, it's it's geared for the platform, it's it's engineered for the platform, it's optimized for the platform. So, um, so that was important though to go through those pieces, and you know we're always pushing on these systems, uh, and so um, so it's anyway it's it's really exciting uh, to work on that, and the and the proof of concepts are something to always be thinking about. It would be kind of my advice on that. We did have some also challenges with long build times. Um, as you might imagine, 65,000 plus news stories, over 111,000 images, I think, when we launched after we migrated from seven to nine. And this meant Gatsby Cloud. Like, if you just kind of threw all that at any type of system that is in a build architecture like Gatsby, as there's other systems similar, you know, that do that. But, like, if you just throw all that out there without thinking about it, like, it's, it's a lot. Like, it's just, you can have, I'll just shorten it, you can have some challenges, right? So, um, so it took that partnership that we've been talking about, and, and I know you're like, oh, he said this a bunch, Jim said it a bunch about partnership, but I'm telling you, partnership between Penn State, Gatsby, Aqua, Media Current, I mean, it takes all that to solve these big challenging problems, um, and, and it's a totally real thing. So I'm gonna let Jim jump in on it. Uh, so one, 
One challenge, maybe this is more of an insight I would share, and I'm speaking mostly, I think, right now to sort of marketing managers and other people of that sort, is uh, we're reminded here that great technology doesn't implement itself, right? That there's lots of new bleeding edge tech in here, but it took a lot of time and thought to sort of build it and wrap it around a context that made sense to pay off. Uh, it's not, doesn't always come off the shelf. Um, Another challenge was getting our major stakeholders, and again, these are people, functional owners, editors, people that control funds flow and release funds for projects. Getting them to adjust to a new mental model of web took some doing. And you know, just one tiny example is the sort of value trades we're always making, but one is trading TTLs for resiliency. You know, sometimes authors simply, despite all of the last 40 minutes, they want that story to be published immediately. Well, it's not immediate. It's very, it's dang fast, but it's resilient and it's safe and it'll hold up if it's ever under amazing stress. So don't skimp on the change management, set the right expectations. Am I still talking? You got it. I'm still talking. You're good. Um, so successes. The authoring experience is still Drupal, right? So uh, while a lot of stuff changed, our authors didn't really feel it. It's a little leaner. And uh, so our users adapted to paragraph styles without much difficulty. Um, how we're thinking about federated components and the design system has some really exciting applications for analytics. Now we can now build in analytic tokens to track and filter sort of by component. Right, and so per adopter, we can track and see how these various components are doing and optimize uh, accordingly. Um, if we talked a lot about campus alerts. We are kind of we are we are very excited about it. It's a good example, um, but it's 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 really just a, a Drupal content type. It's one that hits Firebase. It becomes an API data that's immediately available across domains, and we can push out alerts potentially potentially down the road to you know hundreds of subdomains. Um, a key point is the legacy website was delivered on its own subdomain, news.psu.edu. Um, and we migrated now to live on psu.edu slash news. So uh, psu.edu is not Drupal, and it is hosted in S3. So we've glued this whole thing together to psu.edu via reverse proxy. Uh, and that's part of a long-term strategy to move away from subdomains which you see a lot of in academia, towards amp, um, away from subdomains towards amplifying the value of psu.edu domain itself, which will ultimately, we think, raise the entire university's SEO value. Um, and if there's time to talk about our open source contributions? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of briefly mention this, but there's a lot here. And again, all of this stuff, I know it may open up lots of questions, come see us this week, but um, to talk about it, happy to do that. But I just have to say, like this is this is open source working. I mean, um, it, it doesn't mean there wasn't challenges and struggles and like f maybe frustrations and all kinds of things in the middle. But but we we were able across um, you know Gatsby and, and and Media Current to partner together. Like there were a lot of contributions that went back to the community that's built uh, uh, made Gatsby a better platform for many people. That things that maybe they only could see problems with on this platform but now like helps every site from the smallest Gatsby site to the largest Gatsby site. There's like Drupal contributions, not just on the Gatsby integration that went on, but um, throughout Drupal, as you do on these large scale Drupal projects, like there's things you contribute back to. And I just encourage everybody to always be thinking about how can you contribute, how can you give, uh, and, and it's, not, it's not always code, I just have to say that. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna say this is, this is the slide, this is, this is the domain. Whatever you say on that. This is the exciting part here. This is the this is the product. Go check it out. Yeah, it it works. It's real. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so we I know we're kind of short on Q and A time, but again, like there's this, this is, there's so much we could talk for a, a, a lot longer, as you could tell. And so please ask us questions. Shoot us emails. Talk to us at the media current booth. Um, you know, Jim and I both will make ourselves available to chat. Happy to do that, and uh, and uh, I have to mention, I do have to mention Drupal Camp Asheville. This is a really awesome Drupal Camp. Encourage you to come check it out. They're accepting sessions now, um, and uh, this is one that's worth flying international for. I'm telling you, uh, it's that good. But um, anyway, thanks. Thank you so much, everybody.